My name is Søren Lytken. I'm with uh, Unit Riso in Denmark and it's been there for, for the past couple of years. I, I must say that I was very happy this morning when, when Finn Tapp said that, that uh, the tradition of the university is that we bring out the controversial issues, don't be afraid to, to present subjects that might not be commonly shared by, by all. Uh, believe it or not, but what I'm going to tell you this, this morning, I could have told you five, uh, in 2005 that was actually, it, it's coming from the results of my research on CDM, my PhD on CDM from, from three to five, um, which at that time was quite controversial. When, when I was sitting at the embassy in Beijing in 2008 and, and the result of the, of the research was about to, come to, to reach the bookshelves, my, my ambassador told me, you, you, you better not publish this before you have left your position, um, which I didn't. Um, I also lost a contract with the Ministry of Climate and, and Energy on, on the same account. The thing is that what I'm going to tell you is not as controversial now as it was then. Um, that, that might be a good thing or a bad thing, it depends on how you look at it. Anyway, here we go. Agenda. Um, recently I published a, a, a small paper called Pennywise Pound Foolish and that looks exactly at what Grant was looking at before, namely where is the um, what, what is the investments going, going into uh, to CDM compared to what's actually coming out of it in terms of, of um, you could call it climate capital or climate value. Um, that doesn't look as nice as we would like it to, I'm sure. So the question is, can we fix it? Um, well, yes, we can, but the question is whether we want to. And then finally, a few concluding points. So my, my, my purpose for this paper uh, was to figure out if CDM actually leads to cost efficiency emission reduction. And the way I did it was that I looked at the, at the CDM pipeline, which we are operating, many of you might know it already, cdmpipeline.org. That, that's sort of a signature activity of, of, um, of our center, which is, includes information on all CDM projects ever developed uh, since, they, since the beginning. And with an increasing number of of uh, details on, on um, other projects, including recently also details on the actual investment uh, in the projects. Of course, we also know uh, what projects uh, produce in terms of carbon uh, credits uh, from the same, uh, from the same um, Excel sheet. Uh, and in that uh, sort of pool of about 8,000 projects now, uh, there would be 10 technologies which have a, well, you wouldn't, if you ask the statistician whether it's statistically significant, it is not. But it's sort of still 25, 30, 35 projects that are issuing CERs. I have thought that, well, that's the best we can do if we want to say anything at all. And then the calculation has been based on the basis of a carbon price of $12 per CER. So you can simply see how many CERs does the product issue of a value of $12, and how much is that compared to the actual investment. So very, very simple calculation, and, and a lot of corners cut, but it still gives you an, an impression on how does it look. This is how it looks, quite confusing. But this is an illustration of this, the share of projects in the entire population of projects within the technology that returns a certain amount of revenue compared to the investment. And what you would see, just for an example, the most prevalent type of projects, wind and hydro, 50% uh, of the wind projects here, that's the 50, return between 1% and 2% of the invested capital per year in CER value. For hydro, it's a bit higher. 45% return between 2 and 4, and so forth. You have the technologies down here, and you have the, the, the returns here. Now, you cannot see how many of the projects are actually there. These, team, these are the, by far the most prevalent projects. Uh, but that doesn't really uh, appear here. You would have the very profitable ones out here. That would be 30% of the industrial gases projects. 
returning more than 1,000% per year. So they're quite, that we all know that. So, so that's, what we don't know maybe is that the manure projects here are also very, very profitable. Now, in terms of numbers, that's more, it's easier to look at. Uh, here are the, the, the 10 sectors for which we have data. What I thought was significant, was significant enough to say something, we have them here. Oh, this one. Here are the, the number of observations, here are the, the technologies, and here are the, the, the average return on, on, uh, on the investment per year in terms of carbon value at $12. Now, the reason why I've used twelve dollars is that that would about that was about the price in five to eight when these projects that are issuing credits right now were contracted with emission reduction purchase agreements. So that, that does not reflect the current price level, of course. I mean, if you would do the same calculation today with with the current price of about three dollars per CERs, well, of course the, the the return on the investment in, in, in carbon value is much, much less. So, question. Ah, uh, just, just, yeah, that's actually another, another point here, because if you look at, and you can do that with the, with the data from the CDM pipeline, how much of the invested capital has gone into projects that are clearly uh, commercially unviable in terms of carbon revenues? That would be the red lines there. That is the share of the projects that are not commercially viable based on a carbon, uh, <coughs> carbon return on the investment. This is numbers, this is not the capital. So you would say that um, of those 200 and 275 wind projects, for instance, that, are, that have been invested in, um, the 260 would return so little from the carbon market that it is insignificant. It doesn't really have any influence on the investment. If you then accumulate the investments, not the number of projects, but the actual investments having gone in to these projects, and using, and that, that is, I have to admit, arbitrarily uh, settled, that I say if, if the project is between if it's over 20% return on the investment from the carbon market per year, it's clearly driven by the carbon value. If it's below 20 but above 3%, it would maybe or maybe not. We don't really know whether that is actually the case that is driven by the carbon uh, value. Uh, if it's below 3%, it's clearly not driven by the carbon value. If you look at that, if you, if you use those intervals, if you accept that as, as uh, the case, then only 1% of the capital having gone into CDM has been driven by the purpose of reducing emissions. So that's not so much. So why, why are people investing? Are, are they really so foolish that they throw all their money at projects on emissions reduction that have so little return on the investment in terms of, of, of carbon, carbon revenues, of course they're not. Now, as, as, uh, as Grant said, 90% of all this capital is coming from the developing countries themselves. Developed countries have not put any money into this. So are developing country investors really so foolish? Of course they're not. Well, there's a number of other investment uh, motivations that are driving these activities. It's only foolish if you insist that these projects have actually been driven by the purpose of reducing emissions. If you accept or you insist that the developers are not foolish, well then you have your answer. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. It won't change much, but you think the, the, the easy fix here in terms of having the, the carbon value 
at least having some sort of impact on the investment is if you make sure that the value of the carbon would be available at the day of investment decision. Right now, it goes the other way around. You have to write your PDD and your, uh, have it validated and have it registered at some point, maybe even after the project has been constructed. Then, of course, you cannot take that into account in your investment calculation, particularly not if the banks don't believe in the system, and they don't. So what you do instead is you start with the registration. You have your product, you go to Bonn, and you get your uh, approval signed by the UN. You will get this amount of credits if you do this project and you implement it. With that in your hand, you can go to the carbon buyer. And say, I have this guarantee from the UN. Will you buy my credits? And the buyer will buy it. You take these two documents to the bank. There's a guarantee that you get the credits. Of course, discounted significantly compared to what you would expect that type of project could produce. But still, you have some, at least, contribution to the actual investment, which you can, you, or, which you can lend against, basically, in the bank. If you want to have all the credits that you might be able to, to uh, generate, you would then go back to the PDD writing, the validation, another registration, monitoring, verification, and issuance to get all the emissions reduction that this project is capable of, of delivering. At the risk, of course, at the registration here, that you lose whatever you got up front if you are found not to be additional. So that might... Well, that would be the conservative CER guarantee, as I, as I present here. I shall, I shall skip the loan scheme. I think time is running out. Um, but we actually had a launch of the loan scheme just three months back, so uh, CDM is not dead, if you think. We have a lot of activity going, out, going, going on out there, but it's shifting from what we've seen earlier to LDCs. A lot of activity in LDCs. More than half of the projects we see now are LDC projects. Now, do we want to fix it? Do we really want to fix this system? There's one billion CERs excess in the market. So, first of all, we need, do we need to worry? The EB worries. They had, they had discussions at length at the last EB meeting. What do we do for the price? Well, we established a market, so somehow we'll have to live with it. It's supply and demand. If there's no demand, the prices will fall. That's just how it is. Fortunately, as the investors are not foolish, and because they invested for other reasons, they don't care that much. With some exceptions. I went, when I was working for the carbon trader just uh, three years back, we started looking at Chilean projects, landfill gas projects, one revenue stream, only carbon credits, and we wanted to buy their post-2012 credits. And they didn't really want to sell. I left there, my colleagues continued to come there, and the next time the prices had fallen, they were hoping that they would well, grow again. So next year again they came and the, and the prices had crashed completely. These guys, unfortunate guys in Chile with one revenue stream, landfill gas projects, have lost millions of dollars. That's unfortunate. And of course there are those cases, but otherwise generally it's not a big, it's not a big loss for the developers. So the other option, of course, you, you can, if you really want to solve the problem, you can, just, you can try to increase the supply, oh, sorry, increase the demand, just to offset it with excess credits. And in that case, you can just as well send the money. There's no reason to go through the carbon market. And as I said before, there are plenty of investment drivers around without the carbon market, so these things are actually going to go on anyway. So why do you really want to put this carbon value, which is not really very much on, the, on top of the projects? Is it worth it? There's, there's a Glacier Environmental Fund, Michael Mitchell Firestein, who said the same thing. CDM has long been overshadowed by other, by other drivers in the market. We don't need this thing anymore. And investors are not leaving the market. They continue. And if they continue investing, would you really want them to generate credits? The whole thing was about additionality in the beginning. So if they invest anyway, they should not generate any credits. Which leads us to the credited NAMAS. Sorry, I know I'm late. 
Um, some of you might have seen this figure before. This is uh, the idea of NAMAS in a future carbon market. And would we need the CDM-like structure out here? Well, one thing that they got wrong, first of all, is it shouldn't be out there because this was supposed to be uh, uh, cost efficient. And out here would be the most expensive ones. So, so at least you would have to move it there, where you have the government funding here or the, or the government uh, promoted activities here, which, which would be the supported NAMAS and, and the 100 billion prospective green fund finance that we are all hoping for. So now let's take it out there. And, and now we don't have any crediting, no, no trading mechanism. Where would, the, where would the money come from? Where would we get these 100 billion from? Now, one thing is, what we have is, is a lot of words, first of all. We, we, the last I saw here in, in a German, I, I know, be one minute, yeah. in a German tender was public, private, and innovative sources. I, I really wonder what the innovative sources are if they're not public and not private. You might tell me. We also have, well, the question is, are we talking creative leveraging or creative la labeling of, 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 of funding here? What, 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 what is it? 257 billion for renewables in 2011. That is record investment. It's more than the IEA said in 2010. We need annually to invest in renewable energy. It's 20% it's more than they feel is necessary to meet the two degree target. Is, it clim is, is, is this climate finance? Or what, what, what kind of finance is this? We can call it finance if we want, climate finance. But maybe it's just finance. So, if we want to promote this one, but the, as I mentioned before, the CER guarantee for the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the CDM, it will not change the 90% domestic finance in CDM projects. That will be used for local banks to finance the local projects. It doesn't change anything. What we need is much is much broader guarantee schemes. And what you might notice is that in, in most of the developing countries, most of these countries we talk about, don't even have a credit rating for the export credit agencies to work on. They are sort of beyond scope. They don't have any guarantee option. So we don't have any option or possibility to actually secure foreign direct investment in those kind of projects. So, what we are talking here, maybe I should also just skip these, but, but this is sort of just a few fundamentals that, that I want to conclude with, which is somebody has to pay, and all these technologies are, or many of them at least, not the energy efficiency ones, but otherwise most of these renewable energy technologies are not viable options, and somebody has to pay for it. And you can, you can, you can cut the cake in many different ways, but there is a bill somewhere that needs to be paid. Much of it is based on regulation. It is actually practically all of it based on regulation as long as it is not commercially viable on its own. So you have to regulate your way in through, in, into the, these investment levels that we're seeing. And then remember that one size doesn't fit all. That's what we're trying to do in the CDM. We have this global carbon market. We try to squeeze everybody into the same box and they don't fit in there. Now we have energy access as well as being, being, being a purpose put into the CDM. That's actually increasing emissions and we still get credits for it. It, it, it it's, it's nice, it's sustainable development, no doubt about it, but it's not emissions reduction. Now CDM methodology is great and we have the, instrument, the instruments that we will use in the future under the NAMAS to demonstrate the emissions reduction that we're actually achieving through the activities that we do. But we don't need to use that to generate credits to a global carbon market. We can maybe do it for a local carbon market, and we may be able, if you all develop this under the CDM methodological spirit, we may be able to link those in the future if we want. I'm not sure that we win, that we'll win anything with that. And then there's limits to the number of purposes we can serve with the same instrument as Grant was presenting before we have sustainable development, we have technology transfer, we have emissions reduction, and whatnot. We are trying to serve with the same instrument. If we have different investment drivers in different sectors, we should maybe just try to focus on those and promote those instead and look at what each sector on its own. 
uh, instead of trying to hit, hit them all with the same thing. Yeah, well, the last one is, is just what we have seen with the CDM. We're trying to micromanage everything. We're trying to count ton by ton. And, and at least what we get out of the idea with the uh, CR guarantee is that we will, we will simply have to accept that it's ballpark figures and we will have to operate on those ballpark figures. And it doesn't really matter as long as we get it grossly right.